Hi, uh, I'm Ollie Welsh from Eurogamer and welcome to the EGX Res 2015 Developer Sessions. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we've got an exciting day of sessions for you, er, uh, sessions every hour on the hour. Later on we've got Total War, uh, The Swindle, Titan Souls and LA Cops. At the end of the sessions, if there's time, we are going to take uh, question and answers. If you do have a question, please come up and queue behind this microphone in the central aisle and we'll get to you if we can. Uh, but first, a very special uh, presentation. Uh, three years ago at uh, E3, I was lucky enough to be one of the first to try a prototype of Oculus Rift uh, demoed by John Carmack uh, with Doom 3. Uh, it was really, really exciting and um, it struck me that uh, a great change was about to come onto video games. This morning, three years later, I got to try a prototype of uh, Steam VR running on the HTC Vive. Um, and it absolutely blew me away. And the rate of change over the last three years has been absolutely phenomenal. It's left no doubt in my mind that virtual reality is a really thrilling new frontier for video games. So here, to tell us more about virtual reality in 2015, please welcome Chet Falisek from Valve, along with the developers of some of the Steam VR demos, Sylvain Cornillon and Enrique Olifiers from Bossa, and Trevor Blom and Jesse Kaspers from Vertigo. Hi, I'm uh, Chad Falsek. Uh, so today, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to give a little talk of uh, how we got here today, uh, some of the problems that we're facing, and then these gentlemen on my right will join me in a discussion on the problems they faced and how they dealt with some of those things uh, while they made the demos for us for GDC and REST. So first, good news. The future is finally here. You know, so after attempting virtual reality since the 50s, uh, we're finally going to have it you know, become real to the masses this year. Um, but so what exactly is coming? Because in the 50s, we had cool stuff like this, Sensorama, right? So this guy had 3D motion, picture images, stereo sound, wind, and smell. It's pretty cool. Same guy in the 60s actually came up with the telesphere mask. And this has all the modern parts of a virtual reality system now, uh, minus, the tra uh, minus the tracking. And really, back then, they didn't have a computer uh, you know, powerful enough to, to provide the images. You know, and so personally, uh, for me, VR, I dismissed it at first, uh, because since the 90s, since I've tried it, uh, you know, each new version's made me sick. It's given me headaches. I just always thought it wasn't for me. Uh, when we got our internal demos first started with uh, hardware and we're exploring, it was the same thing. Uh, for me, it just felt like I had TV screens smashed to my face. There was nothing interesting. For me, I'm a storyteller. It wasn't going to change how I told stories. And it made me sick. I, I am very susceptible to uh, motion sickness. And so I just couldn't use any of our early systems. Um, and so I would personally dismiss it so much that I would go down to the VR team and I would kind of mock them a little bit uh, and give them crap because I drove one of them home every day. So kind of every day going down, needling them. And then one day, uh, it all changed. And one day they told me, you know, come in and see the new demo, uh, see what we're working on, see the hardware and where it's at now. And that changed everything for me. The next day, as is Valve tradition, I rolled my desk down and I joined the VR team. So, and now I spend a bunch of my time sitting in, well, I'd spent at, when I first moved down, uh, sitting in this room. And we would give demos here. Uh, and this is actually a tiny, dinky little room that we would give these demos in. This picture actually makes it seem a little bigger. Um, and so the room was from the, st the work we started in 2012 with this camera. We wanted to start with the best possible tracking, regardless of how we got there. Uh, so we've ignored the practical implementation, and we started with this camera and those markers that you saw on the wall. And this was eventually our headset. Those are two mobile phone panels being driven by circuitry and our, our own circuitry. At the top right is a camera. So the camera is looking out for those traditional markers, and it's adjusting for the IMU that's inside of it. Um, and this system, uh, it worked, right? Inside of it, we found the magic that made us think that this was real, uh, and that was presence. So we put this thing on as many people as we could, and we'd have them walk around that room. We wanted every developer to get it. And so, you know, we approached the entire problem of VR as game developers, because that's what we are. And so that was just the first iteration. We also tried some other systems. Um, this is something we brought to the Boston VR Jam last year. Um, there's actually cell phones behind that ugly panel, um, and that was using an ca outside camera. 
looking in. And with that setup, internally, we even tried things like a track controller. And we just took one of our Steam machine controllers, added uh, tracking to it, and saw what was that like in the world. Um, and so the rule we came up with is uh, you, you don't know anything until you tried it, because we're always surprised by what worked and didn't, didn't, didn't work. And then once you tried it, you had to have other people play test it. And you know, we just kept doing that, and we kept doing that. And so we just kept iterating to get to where we are. Whoops. We kept, but we kept coming back to this room, because uh, you know, we liked walking around. There's something really cool about it. You could have somebody who's never played a game before, doesn't know how to use a controller, and they could see something in the world, and they could just walk over to it. They could just stoop down. They could interact with it. It had this natural motion that other systems didn't have, and that, that, just, that really attracted us. Um, excuse me. But that room had this problem, right? Who's going to put up these markers on their wall? That's, that's, we didn't care about that when we were looking for this tracking, but obviously this is going to become an issue if we wanted to actually have this come out to the masses. But you know, what we did learn is people did like to move, they like to stand, they like to investigate, they like to engage their whole body in that experience, so how could we replicate that without having to mark up the walls? And to be clear, um, as we were talking about the room scale, which was what ours is, you know, we say 15 feet is what a lot of people have heard. That isn't required, right? That's just one version of it. You could be seated, you could be standing, you could have a small room, a big room. Um, we like having those options. So this is what we came up with so that we don't have to put fiducials on the walls. This is what these guys originally got. Uh, internally, we call this a negative one. It's still big and ugly because, again, we're designing it from parts we get off of eBay. Um, and those, you know, there's cell phone panels behind that. Um, but the thing on the left is the key, and that's a base station that's emitting the laser that's hitting the sensors that are on the headset. And the cool thing is it's just not the tracking that works, but it's also lower impact, because we're not processing a bunch of noise as the camera's trying to see everything in the world. We're just getting the raw data back from the sensors and being able to process that. And this is what the developers were first given, or something similar to this. It was rough, problematic. Um, but they had the one thing that made them even more different than room scale. So we gave them one other thing besides these two, and that was controllers. So the other problem we saw in the room scale was you would believe you were in this space and you would do this. People would always be ducking, touching, putting their hand up to block. They wanted to have physical presence. They wanted to have agency in that world. And so that's what we wanted to do with the controllers. It's just not about the buttons. It's not about the traditional controller. The controller works in the world and gives you agency just by going like this and seeing your hand moving, going to push something away, knocking a balloon away, just interacting with the world in some way was enough to give you that sense of agency. And the cool thing is, since they're actually tracked in the same physical space thanks to the base station, you can put them on the floor, walk around, come back, and they're on the floor. You can just reach out and get them. In our demo, we just hold them out and you pick them up off from us. So. All of that led to giving the developers those ugly systems and getting that feedback led to this. This is the HD, and with the HTC designers and engineers, we came up with the HTC Vive Developer Edition. And that's what we're actually showing downstairs at Res to developers. Um, because we have one more big problem besides the hardware that we need to fix. And that's why I have people here who aren't on the hardware team and while we're showing it to developers downstairs. And that's the content problem. And the content problem is a weird problem for VR. Because everyone has this kind of preconceived notion of what they think VR is. You know, they've seen Star Trek Holodeck. They want to run around and play like the current FPS. You know, and that's where we started. We started with old games. We converted TF2 over. It ends up, that's actually a bad game for VR. Um, but, you know, we didn't know. We kept learning. Uh, so, you know, VR room scale is more like real life. It's like we're sitting here. Um, things aren't just flying at you all the time. It's just being in that world itself that becomes special. And that ends up being not a limitation, but something special, it's something, a new opportunity for us. But there's so little we know. You know, good tracking really tricks your brain. Uh, one of our demos uh, has a fishing in it. It's uh, from uh, Dovetail Games. And holding that fishing rod for 30 minutes, uh, I, was, I was looking for bugs, and I'm just holding it, and I'm fishing. And I went to go test Skyworld then next, and I remember thinking, I've got to put this fishing rod away because it's too big to interact with the Skyworld world. I'm just holding the controller that's going to be the same for both. My brain has totally checked out and decided I'm in some other place. And the other thing we see is, you know, movies have this, where here's Tom Cruise holding up his arms like this for four hours. Go ahead and do that. We call that gorilla arms. You just can't do that, right? But movies have this 
odd implementation of what they think the world's going to be like in VR. I mean, movies are so bad. So this is uh, Michael Douglas in Disclosure. Uh, he's, he's looking for some files, and he's using VR to do it. So he's doing that by walking down a hallway to a file room, opening up a virtual file cabinet, and opening it out and pulling out virtual files. That's, that's not the most efficient way to do that, right? But the virtual, world, and the virtual world doesn't need to ape this world, but that's where we all start, because that's what we know. And so you map that first, and you find out where that fails. You know, it's kind of like at the beginning of the horse and buggy to cars. Control schemes use the ship. That's what they knew. It's a rudder. The steering wheel is a really obvious thing to us now, but it wasn't obvious back then. And instead, right now, we're kind of an equivalent of the first-person shooters before mouse look. I mean, mouse look is standard now. Everybody accepts it. You would never play a first-person shooter game without it. But we did. It didn't exist, right? And so we're still looking for that in VR. We're still kind of struggling to understand that. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk to some people uh, right now, these guys, uh, who are going to kind of see what they learned working on our system, where they think we're going to go, and some of the problems we had. So with that, we can either continue looking at a picture of my cat while we chat, uh, or this guy with a valve in his head, or the HTC Vive. I think we'll leave it there. Is that OK? All right. So I'm going to switch over to my notes for the, oops, this. Hopefully I didn't. OK. All right. So the, uh, these guys, uh, the first two are from Skyworld. So Skyworld is a RTS that you walk around and play. Uh, it's this really cool kind of small world that you actually get to, inter you get to interact with in a very different way. And the cool thing for us with them is uh, when we first came out there in Rotterdam, we came out with our negative ones, the horrible looking weird little headset. I think it was within an hour you guys had a, your, your game running on it. And we could see what you were doing, and we were super excited. It was just really fun. So like, some ideas transcend the different equipment and kind of relate really well. And then uh, from over from Boston Studios, uh, of course, they took a Surgeon Sim. But the cool thing is it's Surgeon Simulator in zero G. So you have not only the weird carving up an alien, um, but everything is just floating around you in space. And it, it is super awesome. Eventually, we'll be showing these kind of demos to the public as well. But for right now, we really just want to continue focusing on the developers because come this fall, when the headset comes out, you're really going to want to make sure that there's content for it. So you guys want to introduce yourself or just we just jump into the questions? Oh, can, we, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. We can introduce uh, shortly about uh, the game, maybe? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so we've been working on Skyworld, which is a uh, an RTS where you can walk around the world and in VR, and you can interact with the world basically. Uh, what Chad was talking about, like it's it's very hard at the moment to understand how we want to interact with the world and what you want to do with yourself as a person. Do you want to get close to the table? Uh, do you want to step in, or how do you how do we interact with the world? So those are the problems we're 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 playing with now. How are we going to solve that? Yeah, it's it's something new uh, to explore. When we showed our demo at the GDC last week, uh, some people played it, and um, they can actually walk around the table. They can walk uh, all around it uh, in the space of the room. Uh, but sometimes they had to need, uh, had to, need to move, move a little bit closer, uh, or sometimes even in the, inside the table uh, to interact with it. And uh, because it looks and feels so realistic, uh, they were actually afraid that they uh, would bump their knee on the side of the table. So only uh, when we told them that it's okay, that this, that this is not the real world, just the VR world, then they actually did it. So yeah, that is something new. People think in the limitations of the real world, but yeah, the VR, the VR world doesn't have that kind of limitations. So. Yeah, so uh, and us, uh, ourselves for a Surgeon Simulator, we really had the same type of issues where, uh, depending on where you started, we had to relay out the whole scene around you so you didn't start with the uh, inside the, the, the alien pod because that was really disturbing for people. And, and um, also, um, there is a problem of people's height, players' height, for example, if you're short, you, you'll have problem reaching the different aspect of the, of the experience. So, yeah, there's a lot of things we'd never expect in, in, in normal game development that suddenly pop up, and we, we had to work around. 
we have some problems even with uh, things that work on a traditional surgeon where we have the whole arm up, up to the elbows and in VR that didn't work because different people have different lengths of arms. So if you, if you think that in reality you're reaching but in the game you're not, that's completely wrong. Uh, and also some movements with the elbow where you do but you don't do that in VR, there was a disconnect. So I remember Chad giving us the tip, just get rid of the arms, chop them off, just put the hand in there. And that works so brilliantly, something that is so counterintuitive for us. And we just realized that actually it feels more natural. You connect more, uh, there's more presence when you do that. So every single uh, assumption that we had when we stopped working with VR, we had to deconstruct and throw away and start afresh. And I think that this is the biggest challenge for us dealing with VR, is forget as game designers everything that we take for granted that we know for sure that works and start from scratch. Otherwise, we'll just keep on calling uh, locomotives iron horses or putting sheep rudders in cars, right? Well, so uh, body, body awareness and um, fear is, is one of the interesting things for me. Because um, both your games have this where you, you have to approach a table, right? Because it's the alien, you're, you're going up and interacting with him or you're interacting with your world. And you'll see in demos, we see this, where everyone's reaching over because they don't want to penetrate or they don't want to get near that. And it's a weird thing, even though you don't see your body, there's a thing called um, proprioception. And that's where you still have the understanding of your body, even though you don't see it. And so you, you can do things like, uh, we once had a tracked ball in the world and you could throw somebody who was wearing a headset a physical ball in the real world, and they could catch it, even though they couldn't see their hands. And obviously, they were wearing the headset. And it's just because they knew where their hands were. There's a lot of things. If you think about it from day to day, you don't actually look at your hands very often, but they do a lot of things for you. Um, and that's, that's like one of the things that actually works for you and against you, because people are aware of their bodies and want to be able to have that. So yeah, I mean, both of your games, uh, for Skyworld, it originally started up and the, the, the world was there, but the problem is if it started up and you were in the world, people would, like, they would jump back, they'd be very uncomfortable. And you have a part where the, the world flips, and people were really uncomfortable with that as well. And as game developers, you don't normally think or care where someone's standing, right? If I'm sitting slouched in my chair playing TF2, who cares? If I'm three feet tall or six feet tall, it makes no difference, but all of a sudden in VR, it makes a difference. Uh, one of the other uh, game designers, Cloudhead, actually had a problem where they hadn't tested with kids, had their kids over to play the game, and the kids couldn't reach one of the things they had to reach to play. And it's like, well, as game designers, we've never really cared about that before. And now we have to think about those kind of things of how do you adjust for that. So it's a lot of headaches, but it's fun. Um, oh, and then the other thing is, uh, you're talking about with the, the, the body awareness again with the arm stuff. Right, because that is always the, it's really easy to break the feeling of like, hey, that's not me. It ends up your elbow does a lot of weird things all during the day um, that you're not paying attention to. Yeah, but also some, some emotions that we invoke break the immersion. I know, for instance, Sylvan, you, you're a little bit afraid of heights, aren't you? A little bit. So, and, and some of the emotions are very easy to evoke in VR, like vertigo. If you put someone on the top of a, of a platform looking down, they immediately refuse to step in. Uh, step on. Uh, uh, but if you are afraid of heights, when you do something like that, your first impulse is to say, I am in VR, I am in VR, this is safe, this is safe. And when you do that, you break the immersion, which is everything that we have worked on to build for you. So there's not just ki what kind of uh, uh, response you invoke, but to which degree. If you go overboard for some people, it's going to break the immersion voluntarily. And uh, if you don't do enough, or some people won't be, won't be enough. So it's a big challenge for game design. I don't know how we're going to tackle that. Well, you, you guys have the, the fear problem. You had to add clouds to your game, right? Yeah. We, uh, the fir yeah uh, when we uh, first developed our game, the, the table just floated in empty space. And that was very uh, fearful for people. So um, in order to give them an area to walk in, we added clouds as a border or a room you're walking. But even then, uh, it, it felt for people they were floating. So that was another pro problem as well. So we uh, added um, a layer of clouds they could walk on, and uh, uh, that fixed the problem of the vertigo. But yeah. And they actually started to walk, actually. Yeah, they before actually that, started they to walk still, yeah, yeah, before they didn't know what to do. And, and uh, yeah, the w walking around in a game is very new to us, so, and for the players as well. So this is something new to explore. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. We, one of our developers um, couldn't play your game. 
And there's also the um, HTC intro that has the uh, hexagons that has gaps between them that go to nowhere. And he couldn't walk on that either. He just had it. And it was, it's, a, it's a weird thing. But that, that's one thing that's, um, as Enrique was saying, it's really easy to take yourself out of the experience. And you really, we really want to av avoid that, that your first reaction is, oh, I'm going to take this. And, and in some experiences, it, it, it happens. The, the, the easy way out is to take the, the, the HMD uh, uh, off and, and just stop everything. So we, we, we need to make things really subtle. But it, there is such a depth and such realism that actually simple things can provoke a lot of emotions. And actually, understatement can be a, a good approach for, for VR. And I mean, in Skyworld, because we've, we've tried it. <laughs> in Skyworld, you, you know, you a lot of subtlety, a lot of little animation. You want to look at these things that don't really exist, but are just there in front of you like, like if they exist. It, it's, it's really, I mean, it's a whole new world. Maybe big explosions isn't the way to go for VR. Well, one of the ways that we jokingly say that, you know, we've had success in when we make our little puzzles or little, little experiments is if someone does the VR giggle, the VR giggle is you see something mundane that you've seen a million times. You've blown up a balloon, you've seen a balloon, and you do it for the first time in VR, and you just start giggling because it's exactly the way it should be, and your brain doesn't know what to do, so it nervously giggles, I guess. I don't know. Um, it's, it's very strange. Even uh, 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 playing VR is very fun, but even more fun to watch someone play VR. They just stand around and... and they really enjoy themselves, and sometimes they just giggle like a little schoolgirl, because it's so impressive, and, and that's just great to see how VR affects you in a whole new way. Uh, that, th this is something that uh, we have noticed more when we, when we start to work with the Vive. Uh, it's because when people can walk around, and because it's so precise, and you have something that represents both your hands in space, uh, it feels far more realistic than any other VR experience that we had before, seated or using keyboard and mouse or game pads. That, that's, all, that's not the language of VR, if you, if you see what I mean. Well, because when you put the helmet, and the first thing you, you want to do is to see your hands or something that you're holding. And now that you can do that, all the experience become more believable. And this is where you get the giggles and, and all these strange reactions that even the most mundane of things are so impressive for the player because they didn't expect that to be so realistic. They didn't expect it to be possible. But I tell you, it is, and it's, uh, every time I see someone get into VR4, especially for the first time, when they got the, the slack jaw and, and, and yeah. looking up and not, want, not wanting to do anything of the stuff that we wanted them to do, they just sit there for half an hour looking around, <laughs> That's, that, they, we got something, something right there. You have to see it for yourself as well. It's really hard to explain. So only until you've seen it for yourself, you, you know how amazing VR is, and especially the HTC. Yep, for all the years that I've given demos for all of our games and, and worked on them, only at GDC this last year did we, we would track the number of hugs we got. Because <laughs> people would come out and not be sure what to do, so they'd hug you. Uh, Jay Casdale from 17-Bit actually started crying. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what that was about, but it was, it was, it was a pretty weird moment. But it is this thing of people... You, you don't know what to do with the emotions that you've just had. And since the things happen to you in the world, you have them, right? And this is going to be an interesting thing to do as we start exploring the game space because things like horror are going to be really scary. If you're scared after watching a scary movie and you leave lights on, I'm not sure what you're going to do after playing a scary experience in VR. Um, that, that'll be interesting because that that sense of dread or that like the, the sense of happiness or fun. I mean, most of our demos are purposely fun. I mean, you're you're ripping apart an alien to try to save him, kind of in your game, which I guess is, I guess is horrible. That sounds horrible when I say that. <laughs> you're trying to save an alien um, through surgery, or uh, there's like another game, Job Simulator, where you're just making food, but it's just so silly. Um, that's the other cool thing uh, in both those games, and your, your game as well represents, is uh, you don't have to have natural like, or realistic graphics. Your brain is really adept. It's either, I, I, I argue with myself all the time if my brain's really stupid or really smart, that it can adapt really quickly and say, oh, I'm in a cartoon. Okay, I'm good with that. I'm in a cartoon, that's where I am. And so I think originally people would thought that virtual reality for your brain to really buy it is going to have to be about realistic graphics. It's going to have to have all this going on. But instead, it has to have a consistency to the world. It has to hold up. 
And then that's where you see any little thing, like a weird animation, we'll break it for you. Um, all these little things that you'd never noticed before become important, but the greater things, the bigger things, the graphics, your brain just adapts really quickly and as long as it's a consistent look and feel. So one of the things is you're looking at games that are coming out or, or being worked on, you can't judge them by screenshots. This is one of the things I'd, I'd posted about asking of how are we going to fix this problem? Because you can't see a screenshot of it. You can't even see a video of it. You kind of really need to experience it. Uh, during the demo loops, so we give, the, we give the demos all the time, and uh, there's a demo uh, from Weaver, Weaver. They just changed their name, sorry. Uh, the Blue, which is a giant whale, goes in it. And I'm looking on the monitor for, you know, two weeks practicing the demos. And just, oh yeah, the whale looks really good. They updated the art, the whale looks really good. And then I go put the headset on and I see the whale again and I still jump back and step back because the monitor just isn't able to capture what I'm actually looking at. So I don't know how we solve that problem going forward of making sure people understand exactly what's experiencing. And I think it's gonna have to be word of mouth, right? I, I don't know. But even trying to describe how the experience is for everyone who hasn't tried, every time they try afterwards, it's like, okay, I didn't get it until I tried. Yeah. And it happens to every single person. No one can capture it by, by description. Description doesn't do the job. So I think that demos is probably the way forward. Uh, people having stations around, people can try. Yeah, it probably exactly. talks aren't the way. <laughs> <laughs> everyone just has to try it. It's basically the, the perfect mind fuck. You don't know what's happening. Your, your brain doesn't understand it, but it, it accepts it it's, uh, as truth. Yes. You just go with the flow and then it works. Yeah. So the, the one thing I've seen that did, didn't work for me is, is, the, is the, the uncanny valley. When I, I see people trying to do realistic models, it's just that step away from the real thing, then it breaks. Yeah. Cartoony, you accept. Uh, the first time I saw Gladys on, on the Valve demo, on the, I think, oh wow. This is, I want to talk to her. I want to talk to her now. I, I, I'm, I'm not happy being mute because that was a character that I knew before and all of a sudden it was real. It was there. I could touch it. Um, it's so much power. It's so different. And, but I, I, I don't know how, how we're going to explain that to people without trying. Just try and buy it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, as, as I think we have five more minutes for this or five more minutes before we're done. I wasn't sure what that was. Oh, so should we do Q&A then? Or did you want to do Q&A? Was that five more minutes till we're done? So we should do Q&A? Does anyone have any questions? Or is this complete uh, confusion enough to, <laughs> to offer you nothing? Hey, it's you again. Hey. <laughs> Hi, it's uh, Avinash from uh, We Make VR. Um, question. As, you, as developers, you know that real world scale is important and your interface, your avatar, needs to match your physical body. But what, from a storytelling perspective, what if you don't want, to be, want the player to be him or herself, but a different character? Uh, so maybe a small girl would want to play a James Bond type character in an action game. That means your scale, your, your interface is completely off. Have you thought about that, experimented with that? Yep. We tried on Surgeon as well, and then because of the height and, and we have the panels on the side, we wanted everybody to be able to reach, so we tried just in people's heights. They don't connect. There's mm -hmm. a problem. You yeah. feel like your legs are through the floor. You are very aware of your height, of, of your body. Uh, and this is a problem when you have seated experiences as well. When you're playing uh, someone who is running around and you're seated, it is, there is something clearly wrong, and that can induce motion sickness as well. So I, I haven't found a solution yet, and this is the important thing. Never say it's impossible. Right, but uh, I, I personally haven't found a solution. Don't know about you guys, okay. but what I can tell you that scale, uh, first person. Everybody says the first person is the best thing. Sometimes it's not. Dioramas work very, very well. Skyward is a good example of that. The the experience is just as good, if it's not better than first person. Yeah, I wanted to to comment on that. But, um, in a seated experience, actually being in third person behind your character is a really nice way of. of uh, seeing the story. So even if that character is smaller or somebody else, uh, you're a man and it's a little girl, it doesn't really matter, that's okay. But if you're really that character in first person, then it becomes a problem. So that's really something we, we should solve. And especially in room scale, it becomes even harder because you're walking, you're not really following anyone. So in, in that case, if you, how would you then deal with IPD? For example, if you would want to play a mouse character, you, of course, deal with a completely different IPD than the physical IPD of the player. 
No, you you can you can scale, um, and yeah, there's 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 being a, you can be in a small you can be a small thing in a small world, but you're still you. The actual making you think that you're the small person or making you think you're the large person is, I think, the it, thing that we're talking about is the harder. It's more the scale of the world. When you change the yeah. IPD, um, the world feels bigger or smaller. So you can feel like you're yourself when you were younger and everything was bigger, but you still feel your body like it is. You're still the height you, you are. Um, it's just the world is bigger. We, we have that problem with, with surgeon, which is not built at a scale to one, and we had to adjust that. As soon as it's off a little bit, you feel it, it, it feels weird. You feel like you're small or big or giant. Okay. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Um, hi, sorry for asking the like obvious question, but like I'm sure any devs in this room are like, sitting here thinking, all of these ideas that I've had for ages which didn't quite work on other hardware because it wasn't quite there, I can now do those. Um, how do we get it? How do you get a dev kit? Yeah. Um, we'll have a sign up soon on the, our website, um, and they'll be because they'll be coming out this spring, and then the actual kit itself will be coming out uh, later this year. Thank so you. it'll just be through there. Uh, hello. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, you say that with technology improving, virtual reality is now more realistic. But how are you going to prevent? like people being completely torn off from reality, like the case you were talking about with the fishing rod when you went to play Skyworld, or prevent, like in the case of the Virtual Boy, the actual virtual reality software actually damaging the user themselves physically. I wasn't aware that that actually physically damaged anyone. Uh, I mean, I think we've, we've been in the headsets for hours on end, and when you take them off, you, you know where you are. I mean, it's the same with... Anything when you've, I mean, I've played first person shooters for six hours and gone to bed and my dreams have motion in them, right? I think that carries on, but most people are able, I think, to be able to make that disconnection. But once you're, when you're in there is the thing that you lose track of. That's when you look and you're like, oh, wait, I'm still in this room. I, how can I still be in this room? Yeah, that's what I was referring to because you still play a game and then when you come up, you still think like, you're in that game and you've got to do something. That's, that's, that's probably my major concern. I'm not... As, as Chess was saying, our brain is really good at um, adjusting one way in, to get into VR, but when you get out, it, you adjust as, as quickly. Um, now you need to be careful that you know, you, you, you're in good health and when, you, when you're using it and you don't abuse it, like, like everything. Um, but yeah, we, we can be in there for quite a, quite a long while. You take it off and you're back, you, you know, you're back in the room. The act of just the act of taking it off is a is a division, right? It's a very well marked. Oh, okay, I'm in. Oh, I'm out. That's it's even a physical act serves to mark the mark that. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, uh, my question was already asked, so I came up with another one. Uh, <laughs> so I'm a PhD student working on spatial cognition in virtual environments, and uh, this is really interesting for me, of course. Uh, but how do you deal with interaction? So do you always use some kind of controller for interaction, interacting in the virtual worlds, or motion sensors, or Kinect, or what, what do you use for this? Well, so we, we've tried a bunch of things. And what we've settled on is a really simplified controller. We wanted it so that if you've never played a game, you hold this in your hand, you know what to do. It's not, I don't look, need to go A, X, B, Y, right? Like you just know it's a thumb, you're, it's already resting on the pad, there's a trigger and a squeeze. So we just kind of simplified that. But really the big thing is having this thing that you move around in the world that you can see that gives you agency, we found was the biggest thing. That above all, is the biggest interaction where, where you're like, oh, I have agency in this world, so I'm in this world. Okay, uh, one more question. Yeah. Have you experienced any like novelty factor after you use it and the wow effect goes away? Is it more like, okay, this is it? Um, we, we joke about this as people, you, you walk around things and then you know, the, the, the problem they have of people doing this and then you, know, you learn that you can get up to things, but I still, to this day, walk around and respect the 3D virtual things because my brain is just kind of like, let's play it safe. People are still quite bad at thinking in 3D when they have the, the headset on. They, they move in 2D at first, so left, right, before they actually start moving around in the room. That's already a step for them. 
And also what we do is we have a, one of the controllers is turned into a wand in the game, and you can aim at stuff, but also at buttons. And what we thought, what would be intuitual, is that you aim at a button and then you press, uh, and then you press the button. But some people actually still use it as a cursor, so they point at it in 2D instead of in like a trigger. They still point with the, the pointer against it in 2D. So it's, it's still a mindset to, to switch for people before they can really, you really have to get used to it. Yeah, and, and when the, once the novelty factor goes away, you, you get really comfortable in it. Uh, um, we, in our experience, what, what's nice to see is when people start to have a little bit of time in it, uh, the alien hand tend to go in front of your face, and when we look at them, we, I can see the moment where they're comfortable is when they do this. They just push the hand away with the back of their hand. They're not trying to grab it or anything. They just push it away. They keep doing what they're doing. Uh, and so at that point, you're, you're in the experience. The novelty factor is gone, but you're enjoying it. You're, you're like if you were in a different, in, a, in another place, and your body perception still goes on. You still will not walk through the, the, the table, you will still, still not put your face through the, through the body. You can do it, but nobody does it. It's, it gets harder for me to do it, actually. Okay, thanks for the great talk. And I think that's it. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> <laughs> no, <Yep>. sorry. <laughs> uh, that's all we've got time for. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Uh, on your way out, please use the exits at the rear. And don't forget, Total War is up next. But for now, please give a very warm hand to Chet and the guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good job, guys. Yo, peep the style and the kids checking for it. The number one question is how could you ignore it? We drop right back in the cut over basement tracks. Or